it feels more like I got cheesed. It gets really frustrating. The more I've played these type of games, the more I realize that every loss, every setback, it feels like a waste of time. I guarantee you, if you try it first few times, you're gonna fail. Nowhere in this move list is the move that I'm about to show you, and definitely it's something that was very tempting for me throughout this entire experience. Will I stay free to play? Um, is Zenless Zone Zero worth playing for free to play players? I have logged over a hundred hours playing this game and I've been playing practically nonstop. And finally, I have reached the peak of the mountain, the top of Mount Olympus, the summit which sees everything this game has to offer. I have finally reached level 40 and for a free to play player, that's pretty quick. To put it in perspective, Mr. Pokey, a pretty big gacha content creator who I'm pretty sure has streamed the game every day since launch as a free-to-play player, is only level 38. So I would say that's pretty quick. Now, you might be wondering, what's the big deal about level 40? Well, level 40 is when you unlock access to the highest tier of like upgrade materials and a lot of other things. So let me go ahead and hop into the game and show you here. So. If you go over here, basically what level 40 unlocks for you is on 6th Street, you can go to the convenience store, and then you can talk to buy, ask, and give change. Uh, C rank and B rank are available before level 40. And then finally you have the A rank material, which to be fair is pretty expensive, especially the uh, drive discs uh, stuff over here. I can't even buy all of them because otherwise I would run out of Denny's, right? So that's one thing you unlock. And finally, the other thing you do unlock is the last level of the Bardic Needle. And the Bardic Needle is really important for uh, especially like just min-maxing your characters because it gives you the drive discs. Your characters have six equipment slots. Uh, six drive disc slots right here. In order for your character to be maxed out, you need to level all of these things. And like I said, the drive EXP is really high. Now, why Awaiting is having the highest level of Bardic Needle important? Well, the highest Awaiting level of Bardic music, Needle like gives you access to advanced tuning. And it's a guaranteed S rank, the highest tier of the drive discs. So this is where you get and are most primed to farm for your end game equipment. So level 40, I would say it's the end game. It's the start of the end game. It's where you really start maximizing all of your characters. The only thing after level 50 is really just being able to level them up to level 60. So level 40 is the start of the end game and I've been grinding the end game. So let's go ahead and take a look at the end game. You can go to here, the Scott Outpost interior. It's the hollow zero game mode. This is sort of like the simulated universe in uh, Honkai Star Rail. It's a roguelike mode, but the actual end game as far as like what is the peak, what is the most challenging bosses out there right now for Zenless, it is going to be here in the Shiyu defense. And so you can see my progress for Shiyu defense. Basically, you have 10 stages here where you fight two bosses starting from level seven. So over here is only one boss. I've completed all of this uh, current frontier. I think these are called stable nodes, right? And then you have over here, which unlocks, if you complete all 10 of these, it unlocks the critical nodes, which are over here, right? There's only seven stages available. In 14 days, it'll reset. I was able to push uh, to the third. All this to say, I have a pretty unique perspective at this point in time. As someone who has practically no life this game, all the while as a completely free-to-play player. I have not spent a single dime, penny, or nickel playing this game. And we can go ahead and hop back in. So if I look at my store tab, right? I do not have the Internaut membership, right? Uh, I have not bought a single monochrome bundle. And uh, over here, I haven't bought any of the welcome gifts or any of these bundles at all. New Eridu City Fund, the Battle Pass. I have not bought the Battle Pass. I would recommend as a normal player, if you have like some spare cash like this is probably really really worth it i just didn't want to do it just to be entirely free to play just give the genuine authentic experience as someone who doesn't want to spend anything for this game and definitely it's something that was very tempting for me throughout this entire experience okay so let's talk about my experience playing this game as a free-to-play player up to level 40. 
Now, my gaming background, I think, is a little important. If you guys want to understand a review, I think it's important to kind of understand where I'm coming from. So very, very quickly, I've played a lot of gacha games, right? Uh, notably, Honkai Star Rail. Up to the ending of Shenzo Lofu, I know Penacone is like supposed to be really good, but there's just a lot of things, like a laundry list of things I have to do. And like, I have to just sit down and experience the story one day. I'll, I'll get to it sometime. Besides that, I've also played Wuthering Waves 1.0 all the way. And the only part where I stopped, I think I've cleared difficulty three for all the holograms. And besides that, I've completed all the story. I've farmed a lot of characters and, you know, it was a fun time. As well, with gacha games, I've probably played like a million others that you don't even know, like Uma Musume. Now, besides gacha games, I also play a lot of fighting games. So games like Street Fighter 6 and Tekken 8. And I've been playing fighting games since vanilla Street Fighter 4, which I'm very sad to say is now 16 years old. So my experience as a gacha game player, as a fighting game player, I think will be very relevant because this game is kind of aiming for that audience, a gacha game player audience, as well as a fighting game player audience as well. They teased basically a Street Fighter and Capcom collab before the launch of the game. Now, what do I think about this game? Well, I think the gameplay is great. It is responsive. A game being responsive, reacting to your clicks, reacting to your ability presses in a very snappy way, in ways that don't feel restrictive, like, oh, I miss it or miss input or oh, I pressed the button and nothing came out. That is incredibly important. Unfortunately, there's not a lot much you could say about that other than this feels good. It feels as responsive as fighting games. Now, what are the other aspects of gameplay that I like in a game? Well, I like sweaty mechanics and I like sweaty concepts. So basically in fighting games, what you call it is tech. One tech is dodge parry mechanic. And so this is dodge parry, which is going to be a combination of a dodge counter and a parry defensive assist. And how you do it is by doing a dodge counter really quickly and then doing the parry. This might seem very simple and conceptually it is, but the execution window is actually pretty tight and hopefully I could demonstrate that for you. So let's go ahead and take a look here. So you see over here, I tried to do it, but what you'll notice is that I didn't actually pull off the parry and that's because the parry came way too late. Now, let me show you what a successful dodge parry looks like. You would have to execute the dodge okay. counter really quickly and follow it up with the parry very fast. And if you paid attention, my Soldier 11 was doing a dodge counter at the same time as Ambi doing the parry. So let's see if I could do that over here with Ambi as well. Ambi and uh, Lucy. There you go. See, I think that was probably a little more clear, right? Dodge parry mechanic uh, is something that you can use to maximize your damage. And I guarantee you, if you try it, First few times, you're going to fail. So on top of the dodge parry mechanic, there's also the concept of skipping chain attacks. This is a video I just uh, watched a little earlier that I think uh, Sweetily was able to publish. And she introduced the concept of, you know, skipping chain attacks may be better to increase DPS uptime of some of your more damage dealing characters. In her example, she used uh, Sokaku. She said, essentially, because Sokaku takes way too long for her chain attack, it's actually much more favorable to skip the chain attack entirely and let Ellen just have more DPS uptime. Now, another really cool thing that I like about this game is that there's also like a really cute trope in Zenless Zone Zero. So far, it's only really in Nicole, but uh, for Nicole specifically, and it's yet to be found on any other characters, there is a hidden move. So if y'all didn't know, you can go over here in uh, Zenless Zone Zero, and you can see a move list, very similar to fighting games, right? It tells you the button input and what you're doing. Nowhere in this move list is the move that I'm about to show you, which is this. So Nicole usually will do this. That's her skill. She charges up a dark ball and launches it, right? You could also just let it go and let it fly very quickly. Uh, what you can also do is this, right? which doesn't look that different until you release it like immediately, which is this. If you do that, like before she fully starts sitting on her briefcase, 
what you do is have an entirely different attack where she can actually act or swap quicker while her dark ball is kind of lobbing in the air. And you'll notice that it is different because over here, I believe you have like infinite range. But if you go over here and do it, you'll see that it's actually pretty short range. So this is different and it offers different tactical advantages. This will send the ball in the air and lob it, which provides you different opportunities. You could swap into a different character and basically get more uptime of that ball, right? So, which is an important part of Nicole's kit because whenever the opponent is being damaged by that ball is when they're suffering a defensive reduction. So having this lob and then like doing whatever is probably a little better than just throwing the ball out. And hidden moves have been a thing in fighting games for a little bit and it's something that's really fun and it's something I really enjoy. Now another really fun gameplay related thing that I do like about this game is uh, this. It, it's that team building and team ordering matters. So this is my standard fire team, right? So I have Soldier, Ambi, and Lucy and I'll explain why I'm doing this exactly. But uh, team building, the aspect of team building, what it is, is right over here on the top right hand corner which i'm covering you guys can't see let me go ahead and move myself it's right over here right and that's this little smiley face and this is telling you when an additional ability a passive ability is being activated and being like used so soldier and lucy's abilities are being activated right now and the reason why is because these additional abilities are triggered and active whenever you have someone on the same team with the same attribute or faction now soldier has no one in her faction. We have no other character that share her faction, but we do have characters that share the same attribute in Lucy. And there's a lot of team building, really cool um, team compositions that you could come up with, with that sort of clause of having to share the same faction or the same attribute. For instance, um, before I got Ellen, and before I got the best ice team, I had to have a different team with my Lycan and Sokaku. And so what I had was instead I had Corin, Lycan, and Sokaku. And what this allowed me to do was have Lycan as the link, right? Lycan was a Victoria Housekeeping Company character, which means that he would activate Corin's additional ability. And in addition, he is an ice character and activates Sokaku's. So this kind of team building aspect is very thematic and very like immersive it feels very fun to kind of think about what are the type of teams you can put together in order to trigger these additional abilities which isn't I'm to say though like these additional abilities are entirely necessary now for instance like with ellen i think it's pretty important so if you look over here her core skill when ellen deals ice damage subsequent ice damage increases by three percent for 10 seconds that is just a straight up big buff right that's a great ability but for someone like anby right and i mentioned earlier that my main team for a while was uh soldier anby and lucy right for someone like anby you'll notice her ability isn't activated and it's because like i don't really think it's totally necessary you can see over here when anby's dodge counter hits an enemy she gains an extra 7.2 energy which is for her skill which is great sure but if you're not having a big active time for ambi if you're not trying to fish for these dodge counters it's not really a big part of her kit uh the reason why i have ambi over these two options is because she is a stun character a stun character is very important in zenla zone zero in in a lot of team comps because it allows your main damage dealer to get a 50 percent uh, multiplier uh, on their damage so it's or it's higher right but stun needless to say is very important in order to take down bosses and get a lot of damage it's a lot better i think i think ambi stun and how she contributes to stun is a lot more worthwhile than playing ben who only really offers like a shield that would increase your crit rate by 16 percent and that's great but i do think the stun that ambi provides is a little better and so most teams look like this most conventional teams look like this in that you have a main damage dealer that's soldier you have the stunner which is ambi and you have like a support which buffs your main damage dealer right and the ordering matters too because you want your support to 
uh, when she needs to do a quick assist. So after she lands a skill, it'll trigger a special ability for the next character to swap in. That would be soldier. And so the only reason this team building and even team ordering, why team ordering matters is because you don't have choice swapping. Choice swapping is when you have in Genshin or in uh, Wuthering Waves where you can swap to any of your characters in your team uh, by clicking like a number. But that's entirely personal. What I really like is the diversity in team building and composition. So besides this, there are actually some more interesting teams that you could build. So some fun teams you can build instead of like traditional damage dealer stun support is an anomaly focused team so i think one of the more popular anomaly focused teams has grace piper and i think lucy the fact that you could build that type of team um which is a lot different from traditional damage stun support teams i think is really cool i think team building is open and it's varied and it's uh, a lot of fun to think about now, earlier I mentioned sweaty mechanics, and if you've been keeping up with the sort of Zenless Zone Zero like discussions, a lot of people say this game is way too easy. You don't need these sweaty mechanics. You don't need to do anything if clicking left click, mashing left click and dodging is all that you really need to do. Now for that, I have to say that that is an entirely unfair sort of criticism for the game. Okay, it really is because what they really mean is that in order to get through the story, you spam left click and dodge and parry or whatever, right? That is super valid. That's very easy. But in every gacha game, in Genshin and Wuthering Waves, in any gacha game where there is a story mode in Punishing Grey Raven, the story mode is super easy. It's supposed to be super easy. It's supposed to be meant for everyone to clear. Okay, so I don't think that's a like a criticism at all. With gacha games, story modes are supposed to be easy. What I like about Zenless Zone Zero is that the game is optionally sweaty. And so let me tell you what I mean by that. Difficulty can focus on a lot of different things. In Zenless Zone Zero, the bosses have different rewards based on how fast you can beat the bosses. So if you play a lot of games, beating the boss is practically a given unless you're severely underleveled or undergeared. But there's a lot of fun to be had in achieving the higher tier rewards and beating the bosses in faster clear times. Difficulty in games like Wuthering Waves and Elden Ring, for instance, though, are front loaded in can you beat this boss or not? Will you pass and kill the boss or will you fail and wipe? Now, of course, even for Elden Ring and Wuthering Waves, there are additional challenges. There are things you can introduce. You can clear bosses in faster time and challenge yourself that way. In Elden Ring, you could do like soul level one or choose a worst build, right? But even if games like Wuthering Waves keep track of your time for the clears, it doesn't reward you for faster clears. That's something that uh, Zenless Zone Zero does. And so in Wuthering Waves, the difficulty is centered around how strict the timing is and how tricky the attacks are, right? And it takes time to learn these mechanics. It takes time to learn these attacks and how they work. When I think about fighting bosses like Tempest Mephis, I think it gets to feel like ridiculous and cheap after a while. I think what really tossed me over the edge when it comes to Wuthering Waves was when I was fighting Morning Ikes, I think I was trying to fight difficulty 4, and admittedly that's not that hard of a boss, okay? And if I spent enough time, I would go ahead and be able to clear it. But he had this one weird attack where he fires a giant laser, and shortly after he sends like 4 missiles or something that kind of arc off the screen. So it pops completely out of vision, and it hits you, and the trick is that it hits you at different timings based off your positioning relative to the boss. So after I dodge a laser, my instinct is I want to get a few attacks in. But instead of doing that, I have to learn the hard way. I have to wipe and I have to like die a lot of times in order to understand that I have to sit and wait for these other missiles to come at me so that I can dodge them before going back on the offensive. It's a lot of reactionary gameplay and Personally, that felt very constraining. 
In Zenless, the bosses feel a lot more fun and fair to fight, and I'm thinking more about my chain attack ordering, whether my Bang Boo chain attack is ready, whether I should dodge counter, dodge parry, or use my skills in vulnerability window to do more damage, uh, maxing out my hits during their stun state, and feeling good about landing multiple successive dodge parries. The difference is that I can feel very good about myself, about maximizing my damage, and not as bad when I fail, because when I fail in a game like Zenless Zone Zero, it doesn't mean that I got wiped usually, it usually just means that I don't have enough levels or stats or the right characters, or that I didn't clear this boss in a fast enough time. In Wuthering Waves, it feels more like I got cheesed by attacks I have to learn the strict timings and behavior patterns for, and it gets frustrating after a while. It gets really frustrating. And for sure, you can say skill issue or whatever. Of course you can. Even I would say something like that like five years ago or so. But the more I've played these type of games, the more I realize that every loss, every setback is extremely repetitive, frustrating, and even when I clear the boss, I can only look back at the time I've spent grinding and learning the tells and the attack patterns. The time that I spent grinding to learn those attacks, it feels like a waste of time. And I mentioned Elden Ring earlier, but I feel like games like Elden Ring get a pass on this because there are a near infinite amount of ways for you to control the level of difficulty. Now, I haven't played Shadows of the Yurd Tree all the way, but in the base game at least, sorcery builds are considerably easier than other builds. You can also choose to use consumables if you have them, and summons can make these boss fights a lot easier. I never use summons, but you can use summons. Uh, soul levels are a difficulty slider, and the Skadoosh seeds are also going to be able to make the bosses in the new DLC a lot easier. The difference between Wuthering Waves and Elden Ring is that in Elden Ring, you just have way more agency and input over that difficulty, whereas in Wuthering Waves, you're kind of stuck with whatever you've got until enough time passes for you to grind the materials to beat the bosses that aren't really that fun to fight to begin with. With. So that's why I think difficulty is more fun in Zenless because the bosses don't feel cheesy and there are multiple levels of success as opposed to difficulty being centered on passing or wiping. Let me know what you guys think about my thoughts on this because I'm genuinely interested in your guys' take on my thoughts on difficulty. Now, moving on, as far as everything else goes, Zenless Zone Zero just feels like the complete package. The English localization is great, from the dubbing to the writing, and the reason why it's great is because it's almost unnoticeable. It feels like this game was made for an English audience. Now, again, I feel a little bad because I'm comparing to Wuthering Waves, and Wuthering Waves is a great game, okay? But I personally have a lot of problems with it, and this is where I have a big problem with Wuthering Waves. I cannot stand the character names in Wuthering Waves. The names are way too Chinese, and I know that sounds really weird coming from me because I'm as Asian as Asian can be, but I'm a third generation Asian. I was born and raised in the States, so the ability to memorize and empathize with these really Chinese sounding names is really difficult. Names like Lai Ji or Jian Xin, Bai Ji or Yang Yang, there are just way too many of them for me to like catalog and understand and memorize these characters off the bat, right? The dubbing in Zenless never feels awkward or like it doesn't have the appropriate emotion tied with the lines. And you know, sure, some of the lines are cringe, but that's par for the course in everything anime. But for the most part, the voices are very convincing. And I do think it also has to do a lot with the writing. I've already gushed about the writing in my other video for Zenless Zone Zero, and I'm in the middle of making a lore recap series. But long story short, the writing in Zenless Zone Zero is great. It has a very interesting setting and good world building based off the modern world, which is unique. And all the characters are extremely well-defined and genuinely interesting to learn about and know. So hopping back in the game here, right? I can take a look at this entire cast list 
And I can tell you pretty much everything important about these characters. Their personalities, their motivations, their aspirations, what organization they belong to, what their story is, and how they contribute to the main plotline, right? So, like, Nekomata and her desire for revenge. She entered the Red Fang gang as an orphan, uh, and Silver was the person who kind of took care of her. And so she tried to uh, kill the Cunning Hairs, basically, right? Race and why she's a mechanic and what her motivations are yeah she's a little weird when it comes to the machines she considers them like her babies or children even though she's a fanatic of machines her motivation her driving motivation behind it is actually the safety and the um advancement of mankind billy how he passed the forbidden fruit test he's an ai there's just there's a lot of things that i know about these characters right and a lot of the cool stuff that happened in the story involving all of them now compare this to wuthering waves i genuinely do not like these characters all that much i feel like they're very flat and some of them just kind of get thrown in at the end so for instance verena i think she's thrown in at towards the end of the final chapter and her whole shtick is that she's a lowly who uh acts a little older than her age or whatever and obviously is very in tune with plants and stuff um Danjin, i don't know if Danjin actually appears in 1.0 besides like Every character kind of does appear in 1.0, but towards the very end, at the final fight, and basically in a very anime moment, they all take like a, a huge group shot with all of them. And that's kind of what I remember from Danjin. I'm pretty sure she appears at the end. Baiji, I think she's a lead scientist researcher or whatever. All I really know is that she's really hot. That's about all I know about her. Yang Yang's just a big simp for Rover. Chi Xia is happy-go-lucky. I think the most interesting fact I know about her is that she likes Chinese opera or something like that, or like theater. And then Tao Chi was kind of slapped on towards the end. I think she's like the defense general or something like that, but she kind of was just slapped on towards the end uh, to make an appearance during the final fight. And this is just comparing like 1.0 to 1.0. What I'm saying is that none of these characters were very memorable in either of their deeds or their personality right and not very defined not very well defined or interesting to know so the writing is very good and if the writing is very good the characters are very good and they're more interesting and they appear more well designed and the other thing i want to mention is things in zenless like proxies carrots and the internaut are a lot more interesting world building concepts because they have real world parallels. Whereas in Wuthering Waves, it feels so segmented. It's almost entirely high fantasy and it's high fantasy in a weird setting that's like kind of themed around sound waves and music. So like the most confusing terms are, are like tacit discords or not confusing as much as it's just like a weird name. <laughs> The music is great too in Zenless Zone Zero. And what I really want to get into though is how does this game feel as a free to play player? And honestly, it's doable. It doesn't feel significantly different from other gacha games in that it is kind of a painful experience, especially when you don't get the character you want. Now, for example, it took me legit 162 pulls to get Ellen, and I only got her when I reached level 40. Thankfully, I did get her, and I got a few other characters too, but that was a long and grueling process to farm all of that gacha currency. That all said, with the challenges in front of me, uh, with respect to like Shiyu defense, I don't feel super compelled to spend a lot of money, even a little bit of money, and steamroll this game. I enjoy fighting the bosses with what I have, and I view my free-to-play experience as something very similar to a roguelike game. So the last question, will I stay free to play? Um, I will stay free to play until I have a reason to not be free to play. And so the only reason why I would break being free to play is if I really wanted to get into making Zenless Zone Zero uh, character guides. If that is the case, then I will spend to collect characters. So yeah, that's what I think about the game. Let me know what you guys think about it as a free to play player or as a whale, and I'll see you guys on the next one.